previous emailed 37 customers and none of them have responded or agreed to uh, take a take a conversation. Uh, you know, what's going on? <laughs> He's following the email templates from the mom test, basically saying, you know, hey, you could really help me put them on a pedestal, give them a vision. This isn't the sales pitch. You know, can you can you can you help me out? That is great. Uh, however, a couple possibilities for understanding why no one is responding and a couple possibilities to change. So cold outreach is always a nightmare. Uh, in the book, I say that ideally this template should really be used for, for warm leads. For warm leads, it'll boost the response rate from like 10 or 20% to like 50 or 80%. It's really, really good. If you're using it cold where people don't know you, they don't know who you are, all of that, your response rate goes from like zero or 1% to maybe 2% or 5%. Some entrepreneurs in some segments have told me that they end up getting 20%, 30% response rate off of this cold, but it is very situational for that to happen. And they seem to be people with a real knack for copywriting and sales. So in general, I do not recommend ever trying to set up your early conversations with cold outreach. The mistake here is like uh, a lot of founders do this, right? This isn't unique, but there's this desire to scale your outreach too soon. Uh, and so we think, oh, well, I only know a couple people, so I, I need to figure out how to contact strangers, right, for this to be scalable. But early on, you do not need a scalable process. Early on, you need a couple conversations to get you started. So it is usually correct to rank your options by friendliness and accessibility rather than trying to figure out a way to do it repeatedly with a bunch of strangers. Um, if that is not possible, if you don't know anyone in the segment, then it, sometimes it can help to look for advisors rather than customers. I don't necessarily mean equity advisors, but if you look for someone who spent a lot of time in the industry and is no longer in it, they are often happy to share their experiences. If you go to them and you'd be like, hey, this is what we're trying to do. Where do we need to get to before people in this industry are going to like start taking a conversation with us? How should we approach them? Who should we start with? And if that person enjoys giving you advice, uh, that will often mature later into them giving you direct help not always you can't expect it this isn't like a trick but you know hopefully the advice you're getting from them immediately is also beneficial and, and that's sometimes just an easier conversation to set up uh, it is also probable that if you think a little bit harder you probably do know some people who are in the industry already um, if you think who did you go to university with who are university alumni you could find on linkedin uh, who do your parents know, like friends of your families? Who did you previously work with at any job or internship? Like you can cast a pretty wide net here. Like which of your childhood friends that you haven't talked to in years ended up in that industry? Anyone in your like extended, extended network, um, even if, if they're not directly in the industry, but if they know people who are, they, they can start pointing you in the right direction. Now, if it's someone you don't know well or you haven't talked to in a long time, they're probably gonna be uncomfortable directly giving you a bunch of referrals or a bunch of introductions. So what you can ask for is a conditional referral. So you can say, hey, we're trying to do this thing in this industry. Uh, we think it's really cool. Like, um, I, I don't expect you to like send a bunch of emails on our behalf or anything, but, but like, I'm wondering where would this project have to get to in order for it to be something that was like, like these people would be excited to hear about or, or where it would feel like that was a really easy introduction for you to make. You can ask for not the referral, but the conditions of the referral. You try to phrase it in a less stilted and awkward way than I just did. Um, but you know, you, you like think about this ahead and you're like, how do I phrase this? And you know, the, those situational referrals or conditional referrals are really nice for helping you understand like our referrals here, even our introductions even possible in this industry. Because there's also sometimes industry dynamics that can get in your way. An example is uh, after Groupon came out, uh, restaurant owners and small businesses were bombarded by startup pitches and they got what you might call like pitch fatigue, where they were approached by so many startups wanting to talk to them that and they weren't able to evaluate which ones were good and which ones are bad. And some percentage of those uh, people approaching them were, were just time wasters. And so they ended up saying like, whoa, I'm already short on time. There's so many requests coming at me. I'm just going to say no to everything as a blanket policy. And so then if you were a new startup in that space, trying to talk to restaurants and small businesses, it was just impossible to get time with them because they'd been burned out. It was like industry fatigue, pitch fatigue, whatever you want to call it. Um, and it's possible that in your segment that is also happening. And if that's the case, then it sets a much higher bar and you need to either be more connected, more credible, your product needs to be further along, all things that are more situational or tricky or, or add extra risk on you. 
the last thing i would say is that um if you don't have if you legitimately like you think through your extended extended network you, you think through the people you know you realize there's no friendly contacts it's impossible for you to find like warm introductions in the industry at that point you basically got two options i did a the previous q a video before this one is is exclusively about this topic so check that if you want more details but you basically got two options one is to pay your dues and spend the year or two years or three years to become credible in that industry this tends not to make sense on the time scales of a single project because you're like man i'm going to spend two years just to be able to get a meeting that seems nuts and it is it's a bad decision on the time scales of a single project however if you love this industry and this industry is your life's purpose and you you care deeply about innovating in it and improving it like it can be worth paying your dues, even if it takes a couple years so that you're in and you're credible and you've got the network and you've got the connections. And then that doesn't just help this project. It helps every project and every business that you build in the industry for the rest of your career. And it becomes a really valuable career asset. But that's not worth doing if you're approaching this idea kind of cynically or opportunistically where you're like, yeah, it's a really cool idea. We're going to do this. But then you plan to move on to a different industry later in your life. Right. But if you love this industry, then then by all means, feel, you know, invest in, in building that asset. And the other option, if again, you can't you don't have your foot in the door, you have zero access. You don't want to, you know, spend the, the years to create the access for yourself and you, you can't find another approach. Honestly, it's like, is that the right industry for you then? You know, like if you can't get anyone to talk to you, like that problem is going to come up again during sales. It's going to come up again at, at like every point. And it's going to constantly slow you down and frustrate you. And it's pretty unpleasant. I, I've built businesses against that headwind before, and it's not so nice. So if you're not excited enough to, to embrace that and be like, yeah, this is what we're doing. I, I love this industry. Change industries, change customer segments. That's totally fine. It, it, like find the bit that you do love about your idea, whether it's some piece of the technology or some piece of the design or some business model innovation and, and go like, okay, which other industries can I apply that to? You know, which other industries does this team have a real advantage in where we're, we're not going to be slowed down by this extra friction of, of no one taking us seriously. So those are options. Um, it could be any of those things. I'm not saying it's any one. Obviously, I can't uh, diagnose the problem exactly off of uh, an, an, an email. But those are the, I guess, the patterns that I've seen before where, where this sort of thing might help. But by far the easiest is, is stop trying to scale cold email and start looking for the friendlies and the access you already have. Even if that means casting a wider net, then you would naturally think about um, your network is much bigger than you think it is in most cases. I right, hope that helps.